everybody. Happy Saturday. I am licensed couple marriage and family therapist and sports mental health empowerment coach, Dr. Lauren Fitz. And this is my co-host, Ronnie Ransom Jr. Good morning. Good and morning. And this good morning. is House, House Talk Pre-game. pregame. We're back. How, this, how are you this morning? I'm giggling about what we was talking about before we went live. And <laughs> hey, look, I'm gonna tell them. I'm gonna tell them what we was talking about, Ronnie. But I'm not going in detail. We, me and Ronnie were having a conversation about polyamory, though. But that's all I have to say. But look, my forest going to win this one. That's it. And boss. <laughs> mm. That was my John Coffin. That was John Coffin. You, you, never, you never know what you're going to talk about during the week with clients. But nah, yeah, no, yeah. That, that is definitely an uh, interesting conversation. Maybe we'll have that conversation one day because, I mean, you know, there are student athletes who try to, you know, do that in a uh, non, yeah. I guess, official capacity. But you know, yeah. we might we might get into that one in one of these shows. One day, one but, um, day. Yeah, you know, <laughs> man, Dr. Pierce, let me tell you something. I I've never seen it where you know on one day it's it's seventy degrees outside, and man, the next listen. day we got a chance for an inch and a half of snow, and then thirty six hours later it's going to be sixty eight degrees again. Right. It, it's yeah. It global warming is knocking us all upside the head. I told one of my clients yesterday. I said I think. That Mother Nature has bipolar disorder. She is not seeing her therapist and she needs some meds because yes. what she is going through it right about now. We were earlier in the week, we were in the 60s and the low 70s. It was like 68, 69 degrees on Thursday. We had a 70% chance of snow yesterday. It was like light flurries for a minute and then it stopped, but it was cold. It's 41 degrees now and it's supposed to be cold today, tomorrow and Monday, and then by the middle of next week, to the end of next week, we're in the 70s and 80s. Like, it's nuts. It's Springtime absolutely. is here, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't yeah. realize it, you know, mm-hmm. where we still get, a, you know, a couple inches of snow, but it's springtime. Yeah. Literally, you know, trees are blooming, flowers are blooming, mm-hmm. grass is growing. So, yeah, yeah well, hmm, we'll never know what happens with that. But yeah. anyways, man, really excited for today's topic because you know yeah. spring ball is upon us i know a lot of programs have started spring practice across the country yeah. especially yeah. all the d1 schools but today's topic we're talking about coach for performance improvement mm-hmm. so we know that performance coaching is effective because it allows our athletes to establish both common and individual goals team and individual uh p- performance goals increasing their confidence and outlines the plan to ensure that they peak at the correct time, usually for a major event or high profile match, game, championship game, whatever the case may be. So we're going to be talking about, you know, how for coaches and, you know, how your performance, how you how you execute your game plan for your team and everything, how that can get the best out of your players and everything. And what happens when you don't do that? What happens when you lose sight of that? And things like that, because that also happens as well. And for our athletes and parents out there listening, what to look for, you know, when you're dealing with your coaches at the little league level, high school level, college level too so because there are you know sometimes parents can be involved in that matter as well so we got a great topic to talk about as well um dr piss are you sharing a mental health tip of the week this week i am but before we do that i have a i have a shout out that i want to give Uh and and i'm not sure if she's listening right now she's probably ramping up so today ronnie is my best friend for life Mrs. Dion Lackey Pitts. She is my best friend. She is my sister. She is my confidant, my partner in crime. She is the queen of the hush money funds. Uh (laughs) It's like if anybody ever wanted some dirt on Dr. Pitts, you know, I don't, I don't think she can be bought, but she's the one that holds all the information. Uh-oh. So she that is my girl. Um today is her birthday. So I want to love on her real, 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 real good and just publicly thank her for being just, oh my gosh, just just the best. Um she has been my accountability partner, my sister, my best friend, my ride or die. Like, yo, we need to put the Vaseline on, cut the fingernails, pull, pull it back. What 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 we need to do, where I need you at. Um so happy birthday, Dion. I love happy you. Birthday. I love you. I love you. I'm going to call you after the show. I got to meet right after the show, but I'll call her and love on her some more and, and see when I'm going to get them bun buns down back down here to, to Texas to, to see me so that we can tear up a little bit and do what Uh-oh. we do the way we do. Ronnie, I'm going to tell you. Uh-oh. 
So one of the things we used to do, this is like, this is our MO. This is anybody who knows Dion and Lauren intimately knows that when Dion and Lauren say they're going to the store, <laughs> it's so bad, Ronnie. When we were younger, it was so bad that she's married to my cousin. So my cousin, Derek would say, we call him Scott. Skip would say, um, is this an eight hour store trip, a six oh. hour store trip, or like y'all gonna be back tomorrow or Sunday? <laughs> we were horrible. We would, we, Ronnie, we would say we was going to the store and like we would be in New Jersey and go to the store in like New York. <laughs> we, we, would say, we would say we was going to the store and we would be in like the Jersey Garden Mall in North Jersey or like down oh, in DC somewhere. We, but it took people a minute to get in and be like, yo, they going to the store for real? Or are they going to the store? No, when we say we're going to the store, that means don't even look for us for hours because we yeah, on a we, mission. Don't, even ask, us, don't even ask us if we can help yeah. out, if we can join in, yeah. we not there. Yeah, right, right, right. And it's like, you know, life before cell phones was actually a beautiful thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would. I did. I did live a little bit of that life. Yeah. I, made it, I made it to I made it to fourteen before I got a cell phone. So you know, I yeah. lived a little bit. Of that, I, you know, but I could uh, I could if y'all could you imagine if y'all had the technology we had now back then? Uh, you know what? We have often talked about that, and I'm glad that we didn't because I'm yeah, sure I, that we had some videos go viral by now. All the, look just like she wouldn't be able to receive fresh money because it would have all been all over social media. Oh yeah, man, let's go. Uh, I would have so, yeah. imagined Happy birthday, Dion. Happy I birthday. Love I love you. I love you. I love you. Enjoy your day. And I will holla at you later. So, yeah, Ronnie, as part of my my mental health tip of the week, now I got to put my, my eyes up oh, for oh, most look, She got her glasses on. Later. For those yeah, who are just listening, she's got her glasses on. So, buckle right. up. So, and the reason why I want to approach this, so I'm, I'm, I'm laying down the groundwork before I give the tip because I'm teaching a um, mental health awareness uh, training workshop at the end of the month for some educators and in researching updated information on mental health. Oh my gosh, Ronnie. The, and we talk about stuff a lot, right? Mm -hmm. But the statistics were alarming. So I wanted to lay some groundwork and then I'm gonna give the tips because I believe with everything that's going on in the world right now, folks need to know. So I wanna share first and foremost, some common warning signs of mental illness, because I think that, I think that people need to know what they're seeing. You know, mm -hmm. oftentimes, let's keep it real, oftentimes people, you know, joke and clown, you know she bipolar, or you, or you know she crazy. And we say those things sort of in jest, but the reality of it is, that things are, are, are difficult on a whole nother dimension in the world right now. And I'm receiving this feedback from clients, whether it be for themselves directly or for a loved one that they're concerned about. Folks are scared, folks are anxious and people are coming unglued, Ronnie. They, the condition of the world today, I'm hearing more and more clients express fear about dying expressing concern about what life after death really does look like and mean and questioning me about spirituality and the whole nine. Like people are scared. People are really, 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 really scared. So I wanted to highlight for our viewing and listening audience, what are some common warning signs of mental illness first and foremost? And I'm going to give you a couple of stats and then I'll give my tip. So feeling very sad or withdrawn for more than two weeks, trying to harm or end one's life or making plans to do so. Severe out of control risk-taking behavior that causes harm to self or others. Sudden overwhelming fear for no reason, sometimes with a racing heart, physical discomfort or difficulty breathing. Significant weight loss or gain. Seeing, hearing or believing things that aren't real. Excessive use of alcohol or drugs. Drastic changes in mood, behavior, personality, or sleeping habits. Extreme difficulty concentrating or staying still. Intense worries or fears that get in the way of daily activities. Ronnie, I learned something that was staggering. Mm. The 
mental health crisis globally is costing the global economy 1.3 true it was either billion i'll say billion just to be honest it's probably money. trillion yeah i'm thinking it was trillion but it's a lot so the of the global economy is probably yeah. definitely yeah. trillion yeah it's really it, it's the, the the mental health condition of the world today is a global crisis that is literally on an annual basis is just taking a huge chunk out mm -hmm. of the global economy. 50% of all lifetime mental illness, Ronnie, begins by age 14. Mm -hmm. 14, Ronnie. You were just talking about 14 before you got your first cell phone. 50% <laughs> of all lifetime mental illness begins by age 14. 70 5% by age 24. Then to, to zero it in on student athlete mental health statistics, 35% of elite athletes suffer from a mental health crisis. Ronnie, that's a lot of darn athletes. Yeah. That's a lot. 25% of college athletes struggle with mental illness and 10 to 15% of all athletes experience psychological issues severe enough to warrant counseling. Studies show that about 6.3% of all student athletes show signs and symptoms of depression. A 2016 study conducted by researchers at my alma mater, Drexel University, and my brother's alma mater, Keene University, found that nearly one out of every four Division I student athletes show clinically relevant symptoms of depression. Ronnie, we have a problem. Yeah. We have a problem. Yeah. We have a problem. It's a global <laughs> problem. It is definitely impacting our athletes in alarming, alarming rates. Um, and we need more than a campaign, Ronnie. Yeah. We need more than a campaign. You know, you know, it's crazy. Um, as I was listening to you speak, yesterday was in what I consider two years since you know, when the pandemic first began, mm -hmm. because on March 11th, 2020, that's when I think that's when I feel like the world that we knew as what it was, yeah. was forever lost. Forever, yeah, I, oh, I will never forget. I was in class that afternoon when Virginia State University announced that as of that Saturday, that everybody had to vacate campus. I was sitting on the edge of my bed that night when they can the NBA came out and said that they were canceling their season. Wow. And I was like, yeah. oh, oh, this is real. This is real. Like <laughs> from that moment on, I and if you'd have told me that two years later, mm -hmm. we would have gone through everything we've gone through in the last two years, I would I would have been like, hey, man, ain't no way. Like, what? Right. Nah, like, get out of here. Y'all be an extra. You exaggerate. What I and it, it's just crazy to think like all the changes and transitions mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I mean I, I this is the last two years is one of the few times in history mm -hmm. where one event impacts the entire world mm -hmm. and can cause the entire world to I mean you're talking about history being changed forever like the trajectory yeah. we thought of history going into March 11th of 2020 will never be what we thought it once was like right thought of normal like everybody's been saying for the last two years we want it to be normal again that's mm -mm. there is no there is no more normal and yeah. you know i think i think definitely everybody has had time to really like for one it's forced a lot of people to be by themselves and be to be with yeah. themselves and it's yeah. really i always tell people like it, it's the pandemic for in, for a lot of people has been vastly different. You know, I, I feel mm -hmm. fortunate to say that, you know, it hasn't been as bad, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, mm -hmm. you know, me and you have talked on a personal level, you know, yeah, the last two yeah. years have definitely, you know, there's been some trials and tribulations, yeah, yeah. but, you know, I also will sit here and say that, you know, God, by the grace of God, you know, I work in a career that, you know, hasn't, hasn't been impacted by the pandemic in ways that I know a lot of other people have. Yeah. You know, yeah. where they lost their jobs, they were forced to work at home in a way that, you know, they were confined to their house. 
And, you know, a lot of relationships suffered as it, I mean, not, right. I'm not going to say suffered. I'm not going to say suffered. Some did yeah. because it, for, it forced couples to be around each other for the first time for a very for, long forced time. couples to actually relate. Yeah. And it's like, oh, dang, like maybe what we connected on was superficial and not necessarily, mm-hmm. you know, what real couples are supposed to connect on. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it has forced everybody to in some way, shape or form, reflect on their own personal journeys and lives. Yeah. And to your point, you know, I, I think everybody can sit there and say that, you know, in some way, shape or form, their mental health has been, you know, impacted by everything, by all the events in the last two years. Mm-hmm. But with that being said, I think, Dr. Piss, I think the one thing that as a world that we are guilty of is that, you know, in our field, it's easy for us to, you know, have a level of empathy, understanding and compassion, because part of it is, you know, in order to be effective at this job, you have to be able to have that level of a level of understanding, empathy and compassion. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, as a world, I don't think we are, we don't offer that like we should. No, and it's I, evident, I, you know, yeah. and obviously, you know, that's easier said than done. Oh, well, if, you know, yeah. we're just more understanding, compassionate and, you know, loving all that, you know, everything will be better as easier said than done. And, you know, that's just being extremely dismissive of, you know, reality. Yeah. But as individuals, I mean, you know, we're all, you know, we're all here. And the one thing mm-hmm. that we all have in common is that one day we won't be here. Mm hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but you know, I've been saying that these, we gonna all die. <laughs> yeah, you know, through these times, you know, like especially for our people, you know, people of color, the black community, and things like that. It's times like this where you know, as a community, we have to be able to be the be the change and be the future we want to see. Yeah, and, that's you know, right. So, and, and working, you know, working in our community for the last six years, you know, nobody's coming to save us. No, no. Mm-hmm. Nobody's coming to save us. And, and right. I will say that there's a lot of great work being done around the country by our Absolutely. community. Absolutely. A Absolutely. lot of great work. There are people who are really buying back the block and providing, yeah. you know, affordable housing yeah. and homes for our, our uh, you know, our people of color and everything like that. Yeah. But even, you know, even just in the last five months, like, I mean, this inflation is real. Like, you know. Gas prices here in Texas are almost $5 a day. We're at four. We're at four twenty nine here in uh, Virginia. Well, at least in Central Virginia, and it's crazy. Like you know, once you you are young at heart, Doctor Pitts. You are young at heart, but you was also an adult when in two thousand eight and two thousand nine with the last financial crisis when mm-hmm. gas was disrespectfully high. I was yeah. in high school, mm-hmm. and it, it's crazy being on the other side now. Like you know, back then yeah. as a, as, a, as a kid, you know. Mm-hmm. That didn't really impact my family as much, you know. My yeah. par- my parents both kept their jobs through that crisis and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But just hearing all the stories, in because I had I had friends in high school whose families were not as fortunate, you know. They right. did lose things in that. But now right. being an adult, and it's like, I will say this about people: people, you know, will always sit there and say, "Yeah, we have team, you know, a team mindset." Because at the end of the day, we're mm-hmm. all in this together. We should have a team mm-hmm. mindset in this world. But mm-hmm. when you when you put, when you force people's hands and yeah. you make them choose between team and self, when it comes to finances and, and you know, yeah. security and providing, they will choose self. Yeah. And I think when we, when we, when we think from that perspective of choosing self over team, especially when mm-hmm. it comes to our finances and our, you know, our home and everything, mm-hmm. we see the nastiness come out. We see the ugly come out of people because oh, yeah. at the end of the day, they're just trying to protect themselves. They're not trying right. to miss out. They're not trying to, you know, let their families down. Right. And we, we do that oftentimes so much, but we never think that as a team, we can do things together. Right. You know, they say, if you want to, if you want to go a long ways, you know, go by yourself. But if you want to go right. far, go with it, you know, walk with a team. That ties right into my tip. <laughs> it, it, it really does. Um, so my, my mental health tip of the week is, is framed around realization, recognition, truth, letting go and gratitude. And the reason why I wanted to put this concept or this thinking process um, in the forefront as it relates to coaching for performance is because I think that it's really important that our listeners and viewers understand that in order to perform at your best, 
you have to come to the realization that yes, you do have a certain amount of skill set, right? Some of it is just natural raw talent. The other part of it is, you know, you're putting in the work, you're putting in the work, you're putting in the work. But every elite athlete has an extraordinary coach. There, there's, there's an accountability partner of sorts, right? You, you have to realize that you are not going to get there by yourself whether it's a spelling bee or a the olympics right or going from you know college to the draft you know the draft is coming up the nfl draft is coming up at the end of april like you you have to have that realization because let's face it what, what do we know we've seen athletes over the years at, mm-hmm. at various levels that come to the table with a level of arrogance and talk about what they did and who i am and and there's all of this you know self-aggrandizement right and we're not taking anything from the talent that they have, but know that all it takes is for your coach to black boy. That's all it takes, right? All, all it takes is for your coach to be like, nope. And, you know, you can be a walk on, you can do whatever you want to do. But at the end of the day, if the word gets out that you're trouble, this is what it's like. And about touching you. And, and we see that going on across the league right now, right? Yep. So, so there's a realization that each athlete, no matter what level you're at, you could be freaking midget and you could be a star. You could be running up and dead with your little short leg. The realization is you are not going to achieve a level of elite performance by yourself. The second thing is, is recognition. And, and I, I want to tie recognition, Ronnie, to humility in that and people need to be able to recognize that it, it takes a certain amount of humility to be elite. It takes a certain amount of humility, believe it or not, to lead. It takes a, a certain amount of humility to achieve it, it, this elite level of performance because you have to be able to humble yourself in order to receive the feedback that is going to be given to you that's going to help you to achieve that level of elite performance. Mm-hmm. I think about the different times that I've heard, you know, um, Michael Jordan and different elite athletes at various levels give their interviews and what have you. And there's a common theme that keeps coming. There was a level of recognition that they had that, you know what, he recognized that he needed Scotty. He recognized that he needed Dennis. He couldn't run that team. When he tried say, say to that, get everything say that, by say himself. That, say, that, say that louder for the people who sit there and try to say he's better than LeBron. But that, I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm just saying. He has acknowledged that he needed the support of his team. He recognized that, Ronnie. He recognized that, yes, I am Michael Jordan and I am great and I am all of these things, but I needed my support staff to be able to, I didn't win them championships by myself. There had to be some recognition that you're not doing it by yourself. Mm -hmm. Matthew Stafford didn't win the Super Bowl by himself. It, it took Sean McVay and the rest of the team to get them to the win. It takes recognition that this, this ain't a solo trip. Mm-hmm. This is not solo. It's a team effort. Truth. I tell you, um, I need people to stop believing their own lies, Ron. Mm-hmm. And we know, you know what? You do have to have self-confidence. You do. But you can't be so great in your own mind that you, you become delusional. Like you, the truth of the matter is that the higher you go, the, the harder to fall. Yeah. I mean, we see it. Yeah. We see it all the time. You can be up here and all it takes is you to piss the right person off. And all of a sudden, <laughs> You being investigated, people showing up at your house. Yeah. You, you I, get your I, pink slip. You getting fired on Rip Talk Radio. <laughs> I think when people, I think when people do that, I think it's because you know, people people wish for success, but they don't prepare for it. Say that. That's they real. don't like you know we everybody. I would imagine everybody wants to be successful. Mm-hmm. You would think. But often, but oftentimes when you don't have that true self-confidence within yourself, yeah, when you when you speak it into existence, 
Mm-hmm. You almost you sabotage yourself out of it because it's like, oh, oh, mm-hmm. shoot, like, oh, I didn't think mm-hmm. I was gonna get this. So mm-hmm. as opposed to preparing for it, it catches you by surprise. Mm-hmm. And when we, what do we happen when we get when we get caught by surprise? We scramble. Yeah. That's all right. That's all right. And, go ahead, go ahead, sorry, no, go ahead. no, no, no. Ahead, I was done. I was just going. I was going to piggyback on that because Bishop said in Bible study on Wednesday that the road to better is bumpy, mm-hmm. and I was like, "What?" Well, that it was so powerful, and it was like it was profound, and it ties into my my next to the last point for my my tip is that you got to let go, let go of these preconceived notions that you're not going to go through some. <laughs> you you gonna go through some stuff. You it being great takes sacrifice Mm -hmm. being great takes humility being great takes a thick skin and your big boy boxers and your big girl panties on to be able to handle the fact that you know what everybody's not for you everybody's not for you look how much ronnie hate on my cowboys (laughs) yeah no 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 i don't hate i'm just a truth teller is, is you, just talked about living, you, talk, you just talked yeah. about people believing their lies and <laughs> too many of y'all that believe them lies like Eli <laughs> will be in college by the time don't do it don't do it don't do it that is so unfair so look I want you to let go of the the struggle and the worry and the angst that you are experiencing thinking that, you know, somehow there's just going to be like these miracles just going to happen and, and you know, everything that, that all the ducks are going to line up and everything is going to go exactly the way you planned. I'd, be, I'd argue, Ronnie, that 99.9% of the time, stuff does not go the way we plan it to. There's <laughs> always going to be bumps. There's always going to be hiccups. There's always going to be rough patches on the road to greatness. Mm-hmm. It is. It just absolutely is. I tell folks, if you want to hear something that is that is a, a eye opener within that context, go on YouTube and listen to Bishop T.D. Jake's message from Wednesday night Bible study, the, the the bumpy road to better man. Listen, it 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 is it was just powerful. It was just mm-hmm. so powerful. And he Bishop puts the hay down where the goats can get it. So he just puts it out there in layman terms. He's not like levitating, fluting, and all this stuff. He's just a powerful, powerful teacher. And it was just such a a profound message. And then the last thing, Ronnie, is gratitude. Man, listen, folk better remember to say thank you. Folk better remember to say thank you. Folks better remember to be grateful and honor the good that is in their life on their way up to this elite status, on their way up to this level of performance that they're aspiring to be because they want to be drafted. They want to go on to do extraordinary things and plan for their family and and the whole nine yards. You better learn how to spell grateful, forward and backward and bold print and underlined and circled and highlighted. Because if you forget to be grateful for the little things, because you know little hinges swing big doors. How can you be grateful in greatness, Ronnie? Life will humble you. Mm -hmm. Life will humble you if you don't remember to show gratitude in all things. You know what? There ain't been a shortage on. Ain't been been no shortage on no humble pie. No. Mm -mm. (laughs) Life does know how to knock you flat on your face and remind you where you came from. the The supply chain for humble pie is always booming. Yeah, it is true. They pay they pay their workers well. They, no workers serve yeah. that humble pie with, with the utmost enthusiasm. Yeah. Like here. <laughs> and it's not and it ain't one of them foods you can just leave on your plate and not eat until you get mm-hmm. tired. Shoot. No, look, you got you gotta do one of these. <laughs> Take the crumbs off the plate. You gotta grab the plate. Uh, uh, look, you, right? <laughs> you gonna eat it all. You gonna eat it all. Then get mm. them crumbs. Get Man, them but them no, crumbs. that that's you know, I, I think. Yeah. I would like to think that as, you know, as the years continue, like you said, you know, it's, and I've been saying this, it's one thing for, you know, people to talk about it and advertise Mm -hmm. it. It's one thing for these politicians to say, oh, we're going to donate this money, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, fund this money to, you know, you know, it's crazy. Speaking of funding money, I'm just going to say this real quick. We ain't got to talk about it, but I'm just going to say this real quick. I found it. I, I get it. I get it. They made a promise that we have to 
that we have to agree with, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But we just gave $14.3 billion to Ukraine for military aid. Um, I shouldn't have to say nothing else. I should not. I'm just saying, I, I get it. I get it. We made an agreement with them about 40 years ago that we'd be big brother. But, you know, I, just so anyways, um, I would like to think that us as mental health professionals can can and should continue to be the change that we want to see across the world, because, you know, I think this is one of the few roles. Yes, you know, we are people and this is the job we do. But the job we do is something that people should do. Mm-hmm. Now it doesn't have to be in the exact, it, it doesn't have to be an exact way that we as a clinician specifically do it. But the idea is that we are promoting one of my, my one of my clinical supervisors, he says it best. We are we're hope dealers. Ooh. We're hope that's good. dealers. We deal hope. That's good. That's all, that's all we can deal you. We deal hope for a living. That's what we get paid to do. We get paid to deal hope. And I mean, just as a human ourselves, that's what we should do. We should always inspire hope and change and and betterment and healthiness to all all people. So, you know, yeah, we do a specific job, but our specific job is is morals and qualities and boundaries that we all as as all humans should have in our Mm -hmm. own individual Mm -hmm. lives. So, yeah, you know, I think as clinicians, we got to continue, you know, we got to continue hustling this hope. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. Wow. Hustle, yeah. we're hope hustlers. <laughs> I'm a hustler, baby. Shout out uh, uh, Brian McClinton. He's also an LMFT himself. Okay. Genius of a man. Genius of a man. Yes, Proud yes, to, yes. Honored to be uh, under him for supervision. But um, so some uh, HBCU news. So mm-hmm. um, shout out to uh, Paul Quinn College for winning the small college basketball national championship yesterday. Nice. Um, yeah, I did not know that was a thing. You got some shots. trivia? You got some yeah. trivia on Paul Quinn? <laughs> Who won the 2022 Small College National Championship? That's definitely going to be on Jeopardy. <laughs> yeah. isn't, that the, isn't that the school that um the movie with Denzel, The Great Debaters, was based yeah, on? I, I, yep, I, yep. Yep. That, that was, was one, of my, one of my favorite yeah, Denzel movie. movies of all time. Mm-hmm. My, Juicy Smollett's sister. And Nate Parker. Oh yeah, dang that. Is, yep, it was Juicy Sister and um, Nate Parker were yep. in that. That movie was all that. It was really it was, good. Forrest Whitaker was in there. Yep, that's right. That's right. Yeah, because he was the dad. Really and, good. And uh, and Kimberly Elise. Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. I, I need to. I wish they would put it on Netflix. I don't think it's on there, but I need to find it. Prime Video got to have. So it. I was about to say Prime Video probably has. They have everything. Somebody got to have it. So yeah, shout out to Paul Quinn College for winning mm-hmm. the small college national championship. Nice. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you've got a chance to check out um, Dion's uh, documentary, but um, I haven't. You know the news. You know for the next to last episode, you know the news came out. You know because you know towards the end of the season he had missed some time, and then he came back. He was on the little, the little uh, scooter thing. So because of his, having, the the issue, he almost lost his leg. Yeah, well, almost in almost his life. So he ended up having to get two of his toes amputated, his big toe and the second toe. Um, well, that I didn't know. Yeah, they they that was in the episode, um, the last two episodes. They actually had the season finale yesterday. Um wow. so yeah, like I, I didn't know that either. Cause you know, they had showed a picture of his leg early in the year and he had like a, you know, like a like a dent in his leg where his, you mm-hmm. know, um his shin is. And I was like, man, what, what happened there? So mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, he, he had blood clots from, um, cause you know, I think that's what ended his career was turf toe. Wow. Um, turf toe had ended his career and he you know, apparently had complications from that ever since. Um, so yeah, you know, but if you haven't had a chance to watch it, definitely go watch it. It's a, a really good documentary on Jackson mm-hmm. State in their fall season and everything. Really insightful, you know, shout out to coach Dion and everything. Cause you know, first and foremost, he's a family man. You yeah. know, and yeah. it, the one the one thing that outside of just the football aspect of it, you know, it, it's really encouraging and invigorating to see, you know, a black man, you know, it, I mean, just mm-hmm. having the utmost joy, just as much joy as he has for football. He has that much more, you know, being a father mm-hmm. and, um, you know, just seeing him and his son, you know, you know, work with each other throughout the season and things like that. Mm-hmm. It's always we, we need to see more of that because we don't see yeah. enough of it. We don't yeah. we don't see, you know, strong black male lead be 
put mm-hmm. on the forefront and magnified like that, you know, on a national level as much as it should be. So, you know, mm-hmm. shout out to him for capturing that and displaying it for the world to see because we need to see that. We need we need our kids to see that vision and see mm-hmm. that this is what we should strive for as, you know, as households, as families, as black men, and as leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, so shout out to him. Yeah. Um, also, I know we haven't talked about this in a while and it's not necessarily HBCU news related, but it mm-hmm. is football related. Um, so I don't know if you heard um, Antonio Brown was, um, you know, saying that he wants the Cowboys to uh, pick him up and whatnot. It'll never happen. I will say I, I will say this though, Dr. Chris, and I don't know. I, I I know you're an extremely busy woman, but I would encourage you. He's done he's done a couple interviews since you know his whole debacle in Tampa and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But he just did an interview on the Pivot podcast with um, Ryan Clark, uh, Channing Crowder, and um, uh, Fred Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know Ryan Clark and AB were teammates in Pittsburgh and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I will say this, you know, obviously, and he, he has made point of this, you know, obviously how he handled the situation in Tampa, he could have done it better. Right. I, I think, I think he's come to terms with that now that he could have handled that better, mm-hmm. but, you know, listen to him talk about, you know, when he was, um, cause when uh, Bruce Arians, the, co- the head coach for Tampa, when he was in Pittsburgh, he was offensive coordinator mm-hmm. and, you know, that's when AB was a rookie and everything. And, you know, A.B. talked about how, like, even from jump, you know, Bruce, you know, treated him a certain way, you know, and, and, you know, kind of like be dismissive because he was a late round, you know, draft pick. Mm -hmm. You know, he felt like, you know, his confidence was arrogance. And, you know, so he even from day one, he always felt like he had this huge chip on his shoulder because, you know, people judged him and perceived, you know, his confidence in himself in a way that, you know, vilified him and things like that. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, you know, obviously, you know, he got rewarded, you know, for his talent and everything. And, you know, we know that when you get rewarded for talent, despite, you know, some of your emotional irregularities and things like that, mm-hmm. that's not going to change it. You know, if right. anything, it's going to influence it. So but I, I think listening to him talking and everything, he's not crazy in any sense of the imagination. Mm-hmm. Very intelligent man, you know, despite how media portrays him and even how he portrays himself sometimes, you know, and Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. He's also had his fair share of mistakes and he's done some egregious things, Mm -hmm. but I, you know, once again, I say, I have to say, you know, especially in our culture, you know, another example is Kanye West, you know, Kanye West has, you know, done a far lot of things that, you know, people say is crazy. Mm -hmm. However, you know, when you're when you're thrusted in positions of influence and power and things like that, us from the outside looking in will never know what that's like to have that type of influence, mm-hmm. power, resources, and things like that to make those mm-hmm. decisions. So we can't sit there and judge for how people act when they are in those positions. Um, so I, it, it definitely shed light on how I view him and everything like that because mm-hmm. you know, once again, you know, from the outside looking in, if you just listen to the media. He's just a, a unhinged individual who, you know, is given too much money and he's an example of why we shouldn't give somebody so much money. Can but, I touch on that when you when you finish your thought? No, finish your thought. So, you know, I, I I definitely, you know, appreciate him, you know, being out, you know, going out here and, you know, sharing his side and things like that. And, you know, even if it doesn't work out, he doesn't play again in the NFL. You know, he's talked about, you know, ownership and things like that. And mm-hmm. I mean, if he has the team around him and the, and the influence and the resources and the things like that, well, hell, mm-hmm. we need a black owner in the NFL anyway. So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we'll see what happens. But mm-hmm. I, I think oftentimes too much often it's easy in our society to judge people based off what we see in media and things mm-hmm. like that, as opposed to really getting to know the individual. And, mm-hmm. you know, unfairly, we put football players in a position of like, oh, they have to have a moral standard that is damn near perfect, which is mm-hmm. unfair. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I just thought I would share that, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, Jerry Jones is not, you know, uh, shy of, you know, high profile players. No, he he's not. I mean, of course, I don't know. I, I don't think that it would happen. And the reason why I say that is because, I mean, we truth serum, right? We know that back in the day, the Dallas Cowboys, it seemed like every time you turn the TV on, <laughs> somebody on the Cowboys was getting popped for a drug charge or some sort of inappropriate conduct, you know, with her. They had a White House erratic, in Dallas that uh, was not located on Pennsylvania Avenue. Just er- erratic, erratic behavior um, for years. And 
that even though, yeah, there still are issues as they are on other teams, um, but it, it seems to come to the forefront more with the Cowboys. But it, at least from my observation as a diehard fan, it seems like Jerry Jones has become less tolerant of drama. Um, and he is just, it's like you go all the way back to Tia, right? Like mm-hmm. he was a problem at the Eagles and they, like he just doesn't seem to be tolerant of too much publicity anymore that's going to to bring negative press to the organization. Um, and I just, I don't know. I, I, I just don't think because Antonio Brown is so controversial, it's like we got enough. <laughs> like we have enough. We don't, we don't need the, the you know, the, the press camped outside AT&T Stadium um, just waiting for something to go wrong. Um, so that's that. The, the other thing that I wanted to say as it related to um, the comment about people thinking that Antonio Brown is crazy or that Kanye West is crazy or, or any other athlete, you know, I think about, you know, the negative things that people said about Dennis Rodman and the negative things that people said about Meadow World Peace and, and so many others, right? Mm. The, the list is endless. And I, and I want to reframe that word crazy that people use, and I want to replace it with mentally fragile, because I think that there are behaviors that have been demonstrated that would make one question their stability and whether or not they are acting out just because they have no self-discipline and self-control or if their erratic behavior is indicative of something that that suggests that they're mentally fragile. Um, I think that that's that's more set a a more sensitive way for people to to view people who behave in in an erratic fashion at at any given time. I wanted to to share one more uh, highlight from NBC from HBCU news that I think is is relevant for our audience to know about. And it has to do with Jackson State. Uh So Mo Williams, who played over a dozen seasons in the NBA, left his coaching job at Alabama State University to be head coach at Jackson State. Um, And this comes, yeah, yeah. He played 14 seasons in the NBA and won an NBA title with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he is, apparently he's from Jackson. He's returning home to be the next coach at Jackson State. Um, And that report came out earlier this week because the current coach, um, Wayne Brent, uh, is retiring at the end of the season. So congratulations Mm -hmm. to Mo Williams. Happy retirement to current coach Wayne Brent um, and wishing Jackson State. They loading the decks on it's great. I, I was I was just re- I was just reading that when I read about Paul Quinn College. Yeah, um, their season's over with. They just lost in the tournament, so he, mm-hmm. he started to retire. But he said he might he might come back to coaching, so yeah. he might just need a break. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but so shout out to my Warriors. I, he played he played yeah. with the coach. He, he played with LeBron, so you know he got yeah. his title when you know LeBron came back to Cleveland yeah. and everything. Um, last thing before we get into this topic. Um, yeah. Also, um, and I know we'll probably definitely talk about this next month because next month is um, sexual assault um, awareness month. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know if you saw this. Uh, it was yesterday evening when it came out, but um, Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson was cleared of all. Uh, well, wasn't didn't have any criminal charges pressed against him. Um, for those for allegations, those who, for, you know, for those who don't remember, um, he asked for a trade after last season. Mm-hmm. Subsequently, you know, up to I think it was 23 women had, you know, Ooh. filed a, you know, complaint that he had sexually, you know, inappropriately touched them, said comments and, and you know, a whole bunch of, you know, egregious things, you know, things that you don't want to get accused of ever as a man. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of things you don't want to be accused of. That's on a very short list. Right. Um, but he so he uh, you know he sat out the whole season welcomed the investigation and yesterday you know the grand jury just you know decided there was no not, not enough evidence to press criminal charges so you know and essentially he is a free man so you know he's free to you know play the NFL again and whatnot mm-hmm. um 
And he doesn't want to be in Houston, though, right? He he yeah he don't, he don't want no he don't want no don't parts want of any part of the Texans. Um, he he might go to the Steelers. They're saying he might go to the Steelers, but I mean, any team that gets him, they're gonna have to give up a lot because Houston still has the rights to him for another, I think, season or two. So mm -hmm. they're gonna have to give up a lot. Look, they're gonna have to give up the, their their one through ten rounds. <laughs> hey, like in the in the in the word in the words of uh, the Rams GM, "F them picks." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You get somebody like that at twenty five years old. And quarterbacks playing today, forty now. Deshaun Watson's ain't walking around the streets of the NFL like that. So, yeah, yeah. but I, I brought that up, and, and I know we're definitely going to talk about this next month. But it just once again, it, it, unfortunately, you know, whatever happened with these twenty-three women, you know, I would pray to God that these things did not happen, and and it doesn't seem like it did happen because if it did, there would obviously be criminal charges, but. Obviously, there wasn't enough information to say that there was anything criminally done wrong. However, I also find it hard to believe that 23 women who work a specific job all come out at the same time and say something. You know, that's two or three women. All right, 23 women, it's a lot. So from his side, I'm just like, you know, he's cleared of any criminal wrongdoing and things like that. Cool. But from him, I mean, hell, his name is tarnished, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Because now you're associated with something that is, I mean, just egregious. Like, you know, that's not something you ever want to be. Bill Cosby level egregious. That, just minus the minus the actual, you know, charges and yeah. you know, yeah. humility. But yeah, I mean, for him, it's like his reputation that you know, reputation that his family, himself, you know, everybody who's invested in him, you know, that's something that mm -hmm. now he has to spend basically the rest of his life, especially his professional yeah. career, repairing. Man mm -hmm. lost a lot of endorsements. I think he lost like 11 million in endorsements, you know, last season because of this. For something that here we are a year later that he didn't do, mm -hmm. alle allegedly. I don't know, but allegedly right. he didn't right. do it. So, you know, on his end, I'm just like, I can only imagine what it would be like for a year going through that scrutiny <laughs> of, damn, did you do this? Like, bro, you know, you had the world and you did this. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, these 23 women, once again, we know that, you know, it, for me, I just feel like it, it makes it hard for those women who actually do go through something like this. It makes it hard for them, especially, you know, we know that high profile men do these things and Absolutely. it just makes it hard for the women who are actually suffering from this to, you know, have their, their cases validated and have their, right. you know, have their justice. Right. So in my end, I'm just like, well, 23 of y'all made this accusation. So what happens to you all? Right. You know, but we can definitely get into that next month. But, you know, definitely, you know, once again, people, you know, when, when we see somebody of ours going on our own, we, we, we judge far too quickly, way too quickly. So, you know, the, the due process did its thing. So we'll see what happens. We'll talk more about that next month. So let's get into this topic. Um, All right. So we know, obviously, you know, as much as at the end of the day, as, as student athletes, you know, we got to, you know, we go on the field and we perform and we do, you know, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. we are doing what we have to do. But I can also tell you that it makes that job so much harder when you have coaches who are not effectively coaching in a way to improve your performance on mm -hmm. and off the field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why is, you know, why is performance coaching or effective coaching, you know, so important to, you know, not only student athletes, but just professional athletes as well? You know, so let's talk about that. You know, some of the I, I felt like I, you know, throughout my football career, I had, you know, a good mixture of both. I had coaches who were definitely very, you know, player performance oriented, goal oriented, all about the growth and the production of players. I also had coaches who they had coached by title, but they didn't have the coaching spirit and it shows. And I can tell you, know, I, I've been on teams where my high school team, we had loads of talent. I mean, we had a good amount of talent, mm -hmm. but our coaching staff, for whatever reason, could not tap into that talent and, and get the best results of that talent possible. Mm -hmm. And But there's, there's a lot of reasons why that could be. Number one, the first and foremost is because one of the things, the hardest things for coaches is getting, getting a team to buy into your program. Mm -hmm. But even then, like, for that coach, when we think about, especially when we think about coaching football, when we think about coaching football, I always like to, you know, to give people an idea of what that's like, think about being the mayor of a small town. Like 
football, obviously football teams have the most amount of players on any given sports team, you know, in the world, you know, in, on, on an average football teams carry anywhere from 50 to 60 players. Mm-hmm. And you have one head coach who's, the, you know, executive director at the end of the day who has assistance. But when we think about being a football coach, think of being the mayor of a small town. You might have a small town of 100 people and things like that. So you are the representative. You are the leader. You are the voice, the backbone for a small town of 100 people. Just like in football, you are the voice, the backbone, the leader, the the executive director of a team of 50 to 60, whether it's high school student athletes or grown men. You know, that is your role. Mm -hmm. So as a coach, we always talk about the mental health of student athletes. And we do touch on the mental health of, you know, coaches and things like that. But I think in this episode, it's really important, you know, to highlight, you know, how important for a coach also to have, you know, great mental health, positive mental health and healthy boundaries healthy practices and things for themselves because being a coach that's not an easy job at the end of the day you know yes as student athletes we have we have one mission yeah we're team oriented and things like that but for a lot of us our our mission is get to the next level Mm -hmm. we have to go through this platform to get to the next level whether it's high school college and you know professional ranks to Mm -hmm. get to that next level and that coach right there is oftentimes your direct lifeline to getting to the next level Mm -hmm. but what if that coach isn't prepared we just talked about it what if you manifest something that you're not prepared for yet? Right. A lot of coaches are thrusted into positions of power to coach a lot of young men. And yet they might manifest. It's cool. Oh, yeah, I get to be a head coach or I get to coach kids and stuff like that. But a lot of people don't understand the responsibility and really the, the inner workings of what it takes to mentally prepare to be a great coach and have, you know, the great results. So, you know, one of the first things I think about when, you know, we talk about, you know, effective coaches is communication. Mm-hmm. You know, I think communication is extremely key. Dr. Pitts, you know, before we really get into this, I want to hear your thoughts on what you think about, you know, what it means to really have a coach who can, you know, get the best performance out of their players. I'm going to compare it to um, a restaurant general manager, as you know, everybody Ooh. knows that the first yeah. three quarters of my career was spent in the the hospitality industry in in hotels Mm -hmm. and restaurants. And I often said that I, as the GM, am only as strong as my, air quotes, weakest employee, which Mm -hmm. was why I ran my facilities through the lens of aces and their places. That was the concept that I used. So I wasn't, it wasn't a matter of, oh, you're not doing the job, let me fire you. I wanted to develop a rock solid team. And part of how I did that is I had to move pieces. It's just like, you know, is a, can you, can a player be a cornerback and a linebacker? You know, it, when mm-hmm. we think about how the different plays, like you said, you came into school, you had never been a center before, mm-hmm. but they felt that you were going to serve the team better in the role of center. It wasn't something that you were familiar with, but you ended well, up they, loving they, being a center. Well, they, saw, <laughs> right? they, saw, they saw something that, whoo, yeah. it took me a year to see that vision. Yeah, and, and I think that from, I, I see the, the coach, I see the head coach of any team as, the, the GM, I see the, and I know that in sports, obviously there is a GM, just flow with me. Um, I see the head coach of the team as the captain of the ship and you have all these moving parts and the moving parts just aren't the players, right? Mm. It's your, it's your coaching support staff. It's the recruiters, it's the GM, it's the CEO and everybody has to develop a rhythm where they can work in tandem. And when we think about the stories that we hear about teams that are having all of these issues, what are they always talking about? They're talking about, well, such and such might not be the GM this year. This coach is probably going to be fired at the end of the season. Well, this offensive, you know, when, um, when, draw the blank, um, when, when any team makes changes, what do they do? They come in and they overhaul their coaching staff, right? Their defensive yeah. coordinator, the offensive coordinator, the lines coach, the quarterback coach, and they, they create their own cohesion Mm -hmm. you have to have cohesion in your structure your the infrastructure of your team has to be strong in order to win championships it's like and you said it during one I think it was your freshman and sophomore year you talked about how you all were losing but part of the reason why you were losing is because y'all didn't respect your coach 
Yeah, no, nah, dude, that was exactly it. And you, you know, it was we we yeah. had we had so much talent. Like even when I was at state, my freshman and sophomore year, I would argue we probably had overall better talent my freshman mm-hmm. and sophomore year than we mm-hmm. did my junior and senior seasons. The only difference was is the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. It was evident when I got there from day one that the you know the upperclassmen and things like that. Mm-hmm the coach did not have their ear Mm -hmm. people showing up late to meetings you know people you know people doing extra things outside of football that could you know jeopardize their football career and things like that you know the coach you know treating players obviously you know not having favorites but you know definitely treating players in a way that you know is contradictory and people catch on to that so you know when you when you have that situation you can have the most talented team in the world but if you don't have a coaching staff that the players believe in right it's hard. It's, we always say, you know, where the mind goes, the body follows. That's right. So you could have a team of extremely talented players, but when, you know, when that moment happens in the game, especially in football, you know, you got a couple turnovers or, you know, they got a couple easy touchdowns and there's chaos and there's, you know, conflict, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't have a coach that can rally the troops and get everybody back together and back focused, mm-hmm. you're mm-hmm. lost. Yeah. You, you have to be able to, I, I, I believe that coaches are visionaries. And when I, like I said, when I equate it to how I ran my facilities when I was in, in the hospitality industry, mm-hmm. you, you, you have to have vision. You have to be able to see that there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? So I, like, that's one of the things that I've always loved and respected about Andy Reid, right? He's a visionary. And what does the league know about Andy Reid? He's going into the high school playbook <laughs> To pull mm, yeah. something out to surprise you with. That's what he does. When the Eagles beat the Patriots in 2017 in the Super Bowl and they did the Philly special that now everybody does, right? They did the Philly special. They pull it out. When, when you see those games where you have the receiver that was the quarterback in high school and they do the, the trick play and the quarterback chucks the ball to the receiver who throws it to vision. Yeah. That's vision. Mm-hmm. That is vision all day long. And you have to be extraordinary coaches and of course I am I'm giving this through a mental health lens I'm giving this through the lens of a fan but again we study human behavior for a living right Mm -hmm. and what I know to be true is that you you have to be a visionary and you have to be able to not think outside the box Ronnie you got to be able to throw the box away you have got to be able to throw the box away and sometimes you need to be able to come out of your your comfort mm-hmm. zone of coaching. That was one of the issues that I had with the former coach of Dallas. I'm not going to go there. That's it. But I, he grated on my nerves because he played so conservative all the time. It's yeah. like, can you please? It's the and I've said before. I said it jokingly. The game where. Um, I don't even know who we were playing and he threw the challenge flag, but he went like this. <laughs> I said, oh, that's, yeah. like, that's all you got. That's as mad as you can be. You know what? I'm gonna take it. Cause, cause you, you grew a set in the moment. It's like, okay, but you, you, you have to be able, you've, you've got to be able to shake it up. You have got to be able to get folks fired up and you have mm-hmm. to be able to see beyond what's right in front of you. You, you, you've got to be able to look deep. And not only do you as the coach have to be able to look deep, you've got to be able to provoke your players to go deep, to go yeah. like get into the blood and guts of everything that is in them and, and just fight. It's like we said right before the Super Bowl, it's not going to be about talent. It's going to be about who wants it the most. Exactly. And I think, you know, part of that, I, I think, you know, <laughs> when we think about coaches, you know, I've always seen, you know, as, as far as the head coach goes, you always see like kind of two types of coaches. Mm-hmm. You have the the author the authorita- authoritarian head coach who, you know, mm-hmm. he's the, he's the one that makes all the decisions, and his assistants are more kind of the you know more laid back, more you know approachable coaches. Whereas the head coach, he's like at the end of the day, he makes all business and logic. Decisions. Tom Landry. <laughs> that was tough. That was Tom Landry. And then you have the, you know, the laid back head coach and the assistants who can deliver that stern message. And mm-hmm. I think oftentimes, like, 
as far as coaches go, coaches have to also, you know, be authentic within themselves because Mm -hmm. we see, like, we see so many coaches, for example, like, um, um, uh, McDaniels, I can't think of his first name, but he's from the Patriots. Mm -hmm. The Mm -hmm. first time when he left the Patriots go to be the head coach of the Broncos, he -hmm. tried to be just like coach Bill Belichick, but he's not like, he was a great assistant coach and he had his own style and method. But when he became a head coach in his mind, he felt like, well, this is what coach Bill does. So I got to do this too. And if you don't believe in that, if you don't have that in your subconscious and in your spirit, once again, those are grown, those are grown men at that level. They, they know if you're being real or fake. You got to be authentic, even in your coaching style, you have got to be in touch with your authentic self in order to be an effective coach. That's, that's just, that's raw human behavior. Exactly. And so I think, and I think for coaches, that's number one, you, you, you have to be authentic with yourself and know who you are. Like yeah. if you're not, if you're not a, a, a quote unquote confrontational person and, and yelling right. and screaming is not your thing and you right. try and do that, players, players and your staff will pick up on that. They're going to so think you're a joke. If, and if you, so if you're not a confrontational person, don't be a confrontational person. You can right. handle conflicts amongst players and, and student athletes and things like that in a non-confrontational in a, in a non-confrontational way or you can hire a staff of of of, of jerks who, who, who will you, gladly deliver that message for you nice. so I, I think you know coaches have to you know number one you know be authentic with themselves and understand you know who they are as a person you know know you know who you are as a person like my coach who came in my junior and senior years Coach Scott, love you to death, but you was a captain a-hole. Like, I mean, oh, you, go, you Google, you Google a-hole. His name like is popping up. I mean, <laughs> that depends. I, I, I kid, like, I kid you not. Like, the man gave me PTSD within a month. Of, no, Dr. Piss, I, I'm being so, like, I used to literally wake up out of fear. Like, I'm talking about wake up, wake up with an anxiety attack thinking I'm late to a meeting. Like, oh. When he walked in the room, you shut up. Like, I mean, li- oh, wow. li- literally, he walked in the room, conversation Everybody was done. Crickets. What? <laughs> Talk if you want to. God forbid <laughs> your phone go off in the meeting. I mean, like, but he was like that from day one and he never switched up. And so we respected wow. that. Like, he he told us from day one, I'm going to tell you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. And we wow. respected that because when you literally did not want to hear the truth, guess what he was going to do? Tell, Tell you, you the truth. truth. Yeah, but right. he did it, but he did it in a way where like, when you have coaches like that, when you have coaches who are going to be a, a stern, just like my mm-hmm. way or the highway, you have to be fair. Like, obviously you have a certain expectation and standards and mm-hmm. things like that, mm-hmm. but you just can't be flat out, you know, just dismissive of your team and their voice. Right. You know, right. like, I, I kid you not, like, I, I never forget it. After the whole debacle happened in Winston-Salem, like, he canceled spring ball. Like, I mean, literally canceled it. We had three practices, and some of our freshmen had, you know, they had a party on campus, and, you know, mm-hmm. he literally got dressed for practice and everything and walked us out there and said, spring ball is over, and walked off and left. He was, <laughs> That's like, all you got. He was like, y'all figure, he was like, y'all figure it out. Y'all don't listen to me. Y'all figure it out. And he literally... Did not say anything to us for a week. He had another. He had another meeting with us. I, Doctor Piz, I kid you not. He had another meeting with us on a Sunday afternoon. He he's like, let's all have a meeting. He walked in there and was like, y'all figured it out. Ain't nobody say anything. He was all right. I'll see y'all next week and walked out and said nothing again for that week. Wow. We had to call him. We had to call him and be like, coach, all right, look, we we, we get it. You we got it, big dog. Like we're we, we gonna figure it out and everything. And yeah, so I mean, but but that method, like that's who he was. Like he knew right. how to it's his nature. Us. Yeah, he he knew how to target us and, and key us in a way where like we will respect him, even in moments where it was like, yo, like coach is wild and like mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I we look, we come out here, we don't got all dressed. He gonna told us this is what we still. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to. I'm trying to tell you, Doctor Piss. The man gave me PTSD. Like I'm not even trying. To, I'm not even trying to play. Like if I'm late for a meeting, I I start getting a panic attack. Like I'm starting to think I gotta do up downs for a hundred yards every. Like I mean, but no, you know. So I mean, ha- but having a coach like that is it for him. Like I think he he would say like when he went on to the D1 level, 
Like mm -hmm. at that level, you know, there's more politics than there is a D2 level. You know, we ain't really yeah. going, you know, we ain't really going, you know, buck back like that. But the D1 mm -hmm. kids, you know, the D1 kids have different standards themselves. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's all about as coaches also knowing your players and making them feel welcome, which is another mm -hmm. thing that coaches need to be mindful of. You know, as much as communication is key, your players need to feel welcome. They need to know that even, mm -hmm. even if you are a stern person, like they can come to you in a moment but like, coach, you know, hey, I, I need help or, you know, coach, you know, something mm -hmm. going right, you know, can we talk and whatnot? They need to know that you have that ability to create that space for them where they can mm -hmm. come in and share things with you. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have the voice of your team, if you don't know where your team is at as a collective, mm -hmm. what are you coaching and how can you be effective? Mm -hmm. How can they buy into your program if you don't even know what they're, if, what they're willing to buy into? Because right. as much as, as much as, as, you know, coaches expect, you know, demand and expect respect from the players, it's also vice versa. Like, well, if we don't feel like you have our best interest at heart, why would we respect you? Right. Ronnie, I, I think that one, I, there's a lot of emphasis, um, I think, that should be put on that because when you connect that premise to mental wellness or mental illness, um, people, it goes to emotional safety in relationships, right? Yep. And if something is going on, if if a player feels like they are fractured, you know, whether it's because of problems at home or they're experiencing grief and loss or they're having performance anxiety, or whatever it is, it could be anything, but it's something, whatever the anything is, it's something that could potentially adversely impact their performance there needs to be a safe place and space for them to be able to sit down with the coach. And this is any level. This is professional, college, high school, middle school. It doesn't matter. There needs to be a safe space for the, the athlete to be able to come to the coach and or the coaches and be able to have a vulnerable and transparent conversation mm -hmm. about what's going on. Now, I will tell you, because you know, I have athletes on my caseload. And Ronnie, I hear some horror stories about coaches. I have, oh, yeah. you know, I want to shake the mess out of some of these coaches because it's like, okay, wait a minute. You know, you have a, an athlete that's putting their heart and soul on the line for you, but they're fractured and they, their attempt to tell you that they're having some struggles and your response to them is, I don't want to hear all that get out of my face, go suit up. That's insane. That's insanity. That's insanity. What happens if that, that athlete snaps the heck out in the locker room? What, what happens then? Who, who's who's going to take ownership of that psychotic break that could potentially put other team members in harm's way? It's not that it hasn't happened. Yeah. And I, and I think that, I think that ties back into, you know, what we talked about before, you know, like, as much as we, you know, hone in and focus on the student athletes, you know, mental health and things like that, yeah. from, the, from the from the coach's perspective, and, you know, you kind of hinted at it as well, and this was going to be my next tip, is, you know, to, as a coach, you know, share your vision, not only with your players, but the parents too, especially right. at the, especially at the little right. league and high school level, and I think that's important because <clears throat> if, as a coach, you know, as much as you want to get the buy-in from players, you need that buy-in from parents as well. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and if you don't have if you don't have that buy-in from parents, then you know, you you really run yourself into, you know, once again, like is you versus community. Yeah. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. And so, you know, you got to You have to be careful of that. And as, as a coach, you know, you want your, you, you want to be able to have that feedback from the parents and also understanding, you know, you have to know like what kind what kind of kids you're getting into. And I think. This is the conversation that has to be had because we talked about as much as it on the student athletes for coaches. Now, at the high school and little league level, that's a little bit different. But depending on where the state you live in, you know, high school football is the end all be all. Texas, woo, baby. Texas, Georgia, mm -hmm. where, them, where them coaches is making, you know, six Alabama, figure salaries. Louisiana, yeah. Be a coach. Some of these so, southern so let, states, high school sports is real. And so let and so let's talk about that for a second because. What, I think sharing your vision with the players and parents and, and, and un having this understanding in mind, like you as a coach have to know, like, at, especially at the high school level, where these kids are coming from, these little league programs that these kids are coming from, what yeah, they're learning at yeah. these little league programs, what expectations they're being given at that level. Because mm -hmm. once again, 
we've said this before and, and we're going to keep saying it and ladies and gentlemen as as much as we love sports and mm -hmm. i and i think i think it's very clear that me and you have, have displayed that we have a, right. a passion right. for sports yep at the end of the day when you get to the high school level especially nowadays it mm -hmm. is a business mm -hmm. it is a business it really is and i think the reason it's important for coaches to share the vision with players and parents is because look as a coach you have to have a vision even at the high school level Granted, right. you know, obviously, you know, not every kid on your high school team is going to be ready for college or even go to college. And you have yeah. to have, you know, uh, expectations for the high school level. But for those kids who think about going to the next level and things, you as the coach, your vision is important to those kids. Because if you sell a false vision or if you don't check a kid early, I mean, mm -hmm. early, have, have a true, honest conversation with in a way that doesn't dismiss their dreams. But hey, look, you know, I hear you. You want to go to Alabama, but here you are a junior and you're not even first team all state. Like, right. Look, just right. not trying to kill your dreams. But I'm just saying, I don't, think Nick some, gonna, some truth here. I don't think Nick Saban's walking through your room anytime soon. So, mm -hmm. but having that vision and having that level of expectations and, and, and reality with, par with parents and players, number one, as a coach, you don't have parents coming, busting through your door talking about, why my kid ain't getting recruited? Why didn't I get looked at by nobody? You're not mm -hmm. helping them. I mean, ma'am, like, you know, your son is a quarterback and through eight games, he only has four passing touchdowns. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, I don't know what you want me to tell you. But mm -hmm. when you don't have that conversation and you avoid that things, you set you 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 set it up to where like you may you paint yourself out to be a, a uncaring and dismissive coach. Yeah. And then you have coaches like that who, you know, players try to come to them with real problems and things like that. But as mm -hmm. a coach, they got real problems, too, especially mm -hmm. if they're not winning. And mm -hmm. but that's, you know, and I think that's why I think it's important for us to have this show and also, you know, encouraging mm -hmm. these schools to really have mental health support staff for not only the players, right. but the coaches, too, because, I mean, yeah, the players are going through what they're going through. But the, I mean, the coaches, I mean, these coaches mm -hmm. are dealing with this inflation, too. Yeah. Like, yeah. To my knowledge, life, life you know, is, these, is impacting everybody right about now. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, these coaches ain't getting raises as prices go up, especially right. at these small school. Imagine the HBCU coaches who, right. you know, the head coaches get a hefty salary. What about the assistant coaches? Right. They're not getting a big right. salary. They might see 40, right. 50, 60, but depending on right. where you live, that's nothing. Right. right. So imagine you having to deal with that. And then you got this kid who don't want to go to class. You giving him a scholarship and he's sitting there talking about how, you know, and from a coach perspective, he's sitting there trying to tell you how hard life is. Yeah. Bruh. Go pay some bills and then come to, like come talk to me. But yeah. once again, that's being dismissive of the player because the coach in his mind has real pressure on him that he hasn't he can't himself talk with anybody about. Yeah, I think too when you were talking about the um, the reality check, I think that it's in some instances, not all obviously, in some instances, it's just like point blank, plain and simple. This is what it is. But you know, I love 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 the Colin Kaepernick documentary. And one of the things in that documentary was, you know, his coach, because he was a superstar at baseball, mm -hmm. um, he was a kick behind pitcher, you know, and they were all the, the schools were trying to recruit him for baseball. And all of the coaches were basically kept telling him that he wasn't good enough for football, that he needed to play baseball. So I think that I think that as coaches are having these very transparent conversations with the athlete, to your point, like not raining on their parade, but also, again, thinking outside the box, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, in the Colin Kaepernick story, what was powerful is that it was football recruiters that came to a basketball game. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense to me, right? Yeah. When you think about the different positions that are played on the football field, you know, when I think about Michael Orr, for example, and I don't know if a lot of people knew that he played basketball, right? He was a, mm -hmm. I mean, kick butt football player, but he played basketball too. And what do we know to be true about many, if not most athletes? Football or basketball, it's not just one sport. You all play multiple sports as a rule. So yeah. when you look at how those and, and I'm my brain says that coaches should know this, but I'm wondering, like, do all of them conceptually get that 
a lot of these sports cross over. He was yeah. Colin Kaepernick's heart's desire was to be a quarterback, but he was a kick behind pitcher. So the boy had an arm. He had an arm and, and he played basketball and he played football. And it was like, there was this crossover. Like you look at some of the things and he's hurling that basketball like a football. And I think that's what's got him. They're like, yeah. wait a minute. If he can throw a big behind basketball like that, what can he do with a football? Exactly. There are sport, there are skills that carry over from sport to sport to sport. And I'm like, well, don't coaches coach that? Don't don't they don't they nurture that? So it's like then I think I think in some instances, I think it? it to your point, like even you know, even in the documentary, you know, when the when he told the baseball coach, you know, like I th- I think I'm gonna play football, you mm-hmm. know, from that baseball coach, he's sitting there like Yo, you just cost me a state title. Like we was about to ride you to states, and so you know, even from that right. perspective. Right. So from that perspective, it's like you know, I think sometimes coaches look at it from a it's it's, it's kind of a selfish standpoint of like, well, mm-hmm. you're really good at this sport, and, and I we need can win you a championship off of that arm. <laughs> yeah, I, I need you to play this sport so I can look good, you know, because right. right. If, all about you're not, if you're not here, we're not winning, you right. know. And so I think, you know, when that, when a situation like that, when like that, ha- or even a lot of times, like, you know, there's some high schools where the coaches would be like, well, look, you know, you can play this sport, but you can't do that because, you know, we don't want you getting hurt or something like that, you know, and that but happens. Look at Dion. Where- look at Dion. He played for the Braves and the Falcons. Like, he, there are athletes that have the, I mean, we know that it's few and far between. We know yeah. that. But, but, uh, it does it happen. happens. Yeah, and I think a lot and a lot of coaches, even like Nick Saban, has been one of those coaches to come out and say, "If I come to recruit you, and you only play in one sport, I'm probably not going to have you on my team because, no. you know, like, you only you're you're one dimensional in a sense. So like, you don't have a, right. like there's there's skills in basketball that you get that you don't necessarily get in football. There's right. skills you get in baseball that you wouldn't get in basketball. Vice, you right. know, there especially. I mean, obviously, one of the the biggest thing they always tell football players to do is an off season is run track. If you right. want to get faster, right. go run track because that's literally what you train to do is to get faster. And yeah. that and that equally transitions over into sports in a sense, especially yeah. football, like soccer Kyrie, and basketball. Yeah. So you know, there, there's you know, sports definitely have crossover, you know, uh, skills and things like that. But I think to your point, you know, coaches encouraging the players to, you know, use their talents in other sports and stuff like that mm-hmm. to, you know, diversify themselves and mm-hmm. not, I mean, I get it, you know, as a coach, you know, you, you got to be mindful of your team and, and things like that, mm-hmm. but encouraging your athletes to diversify themselves, especially if you see the talent. I mean, like yeah. you said, Dion, I mean, was just, there's just some people on this planet when it comes to sports that mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, the, you know, God definitely he, he sprinkles a little bit more in their, you know, in their genetic makeup because, I mean, there's just some people who do things in sports you just can't explain. Like, unless you yeah. see it, you it's just, like... It's like the freaks of nature. Yeah, like, I mean, literally. LeBron, like, uh, Kobe, um, Michael. Dion, yeah. Bo, yeah. Uh, Herschel, um, yeah. Jim, like, yeah. Tom, Peyton. I mean, just these, yeah. these people who They're just, I mean, just nature, like almost. athletic, athletic freaks of nature. Like, yeah. So, you know, I I think coaches definitely need to, you know, encourage that. Something else that coaches should be mindful of is, you know, inviting parents to help, especially at the high school and little league level. Because once again, like, you know, if you don't have that buy-in from parents and you don't have their ear, I mean, a message you're trying to harp in, you know, during practice and stuff like that, if you really Mm -hmm. want it to be echoed, get your parents to buy in. Because if the Mm -hmm. parents understand what you're doing and they feel like you have a vested interest in their kids, they will make sure that they're passing on that message at home too and making sure like, hey, you don't want to disappoint coach. You don't want to let coach down. So you got to do this. Coach is telling you this is what you need to do in order to get to the next level or be good at the next Mm -hmm. level. So do this. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, another thing coaches should be, uh, and this is something that especially at the high school level that you should do when we talk about being open and honest with your players is analyze Mm -hmm. and evaluate, you Mm -hmm. know, and but that goes from you know what we talked about earlier you know as a coach you know what is your philosophy first of all what is your belief your philosophy your you know your your company statement as you know as a coach what is your brand statement like what do you believe in what is what your is your philosophy? mission and vision statement as a coach exactly and from mm-hmm. that what are your expectations as a team 
and individual positions. Like, what do you mm-hmm. expect with the with the with the roster and talent and resources you have? You have yeah. to make realistic and believable goals, short term, mm-hmm. medium, and long term, team and individual goals as well. And yeah. from that, being able to analyze and evaluate, you know, progress throughout the season, through the off season, and things like that, so you as a coach can know what do I need to get better at and what I can do, you know, who can I bring on my staff or, you know, can Mm -hmm. I send a coach, you know, somewhere to, you know, learn how to do this. So I don't have to worry about it. Learning how Mm -hmm. to deliberate all these things that go into coaching, but being able to analyze and evaluate is crucial Mm -hmm. because if you can't do that, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I just had a aha moment. I think that, and I, I, I've never heard of it, but Mm -hmm. I'm maybe it exists or not. I don't know. When question first, when you were playing for VSU, Mm -hmm. did you all have a mission and vision statement as a team? Um, yeah, and it's like we had a um we had like team, it was like team goals, like you know, we had our Mm -hmm. team goals. Obviously, it was you know to win our non-conference games because Mm -hmm. those were against harder opponents. Mm-hmm. Then it was, you know, to win the conference because we can't mm-hmm. get to the conference championship unless we win our conference. You mm-hmm. know, we win our conference, then you win the championship, get in the playoff. And, you know, kind of I, almost like what every team has, but it was broken down into long, intermediate and short term goals. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we had our, you know, rules and expectations, you know, team rules, expectations mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And then we had our team expectations, but we also had like our offensive coordinator. He had his own very specific, you know, Mm -hmm. expectations of the offense, Mm -hmm. you know, because, oh, go ahead. What do you think about the, the team? And I get the whole goals piece, but what about the organization having a mission and vision statement for the program? And then within the program, the having a mission and vision statement for the team, but then position coaches requiring that I'm not knocking the goals and goals are fine, but what do you, what, what's the, what's the end game? What, what, what do you want? What is the mission of those goals? What is the vision concerning those goals? And if the position coaches actually came up, if, if, the position coach and the players for, for the respective positions came up with a mission and vision statement for the respective positions. And then within that frame, each player developed their own mission and vision statement for their performance in that role. How much stronger would that team be? I think I, 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 everything you kind of, I mean, it's not, it's not as, specific as that but I think we we I think teams do especially in college you do do that mm-hmm. to an extent you know because mm-hmm. even even at the beginning of the season well for us we always did it at the spring practice like they always ask mm-hmm. us you know like you know for you like what is your like we had to, it was like kind of like a questionnaire like mm-hmm. um you know what was your individual goals what were your team goals you know what mm-hmm. you know what are your co- you know your academic goals you know what do you mm-hmm. want to what, what what are you planning to do after school and stuff like that and, mm-hmm. you know, we would always review that each year and talk about it. So I, I but I think, I think the, the part of the biggest part of that is the accountability piece, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and because sometimes, you know, you know, you talk about that at the beginning of the season and then you don't really revisit I mean, it, at least individually, you don't revisit it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because at that point, you know, you're, you know, obviously you've laid out the goals and stuff like that and you kind of pivot on to, all right, well, now it's the execution and practice of it. But mm-hmm. I think, you know, I think, you know, as far as like, I think the accountability piece, and I think you know, we see the teams that who can do that, like Alabama's, for example. I think, oh, right. If if you want to talk about a standard of excellence and a standard of like you know a, a mission statement and a vision statement, I mean, whatever he's Alabama, doing, it always yeah. works. <laughs> I mean, when you think of like the ideal system of a college program, you know, mm-hmm. developing players on the field, off the field, and getting them ready for the professional level. I mean, they're like David is the prototype. Yeah, like they they are the prototype, and I mean, it's crazy. I I just saw a picture earlier. Nick Saban's 2015 coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Every assistant that was on that team is a head coach at another Division One program. Wow! So not only is he is he coaching the heck out of his players, he's coaching the heck out of his subordinates. He's creating mini me's. 
And you know, and you know what's crazy? Up until this season, he was mm-hmm. under he was undefeated against all his former assistant coaches. Wow. So you talk about not only the not only the master giving the students the, the lessons, mm-hmm. this is what does it always say? Like, <laughs> you know, when the kid think they know everything and the parent, like, look, I taught you everything you know, but right. you don't know everything I know. Right, right, and, right. You know, so but, I mean, all but, the secrets. But when you think of a program like that, I mean, just that, I mean, literally, I mean, just from a mental health perspective, just think of like the, the, the discipline you have to have as the head coach. I mean, to yeah. maintain that level of, we talked about last week, choose your hard. Yeah, that's right. As a, as a coach, it is hard to build your program up to, you know, a, a powerhouse. Mm-hmm. It is just as hard, if not harder, to stay there and maintain that. Right. And they I mean, always say it's harder to maintain than it is to, to get there. That's get why there. They say going back to championships year after year after year and, and winning multiple championships in a row is hard, but he, he's even got the prototype for that. <laughs> and, I, and I mean, he just lost his third national title, but he still has the most national titles of any coach in college yeah. football history, yeah, which he's is beast. he's lost three national titles and he can sit there and say, well, I still have the most national titles in history. Right. That level of excellence and discipline, when you think about a coach being a performance-minded coach and, and a coach who wants to produce results, mm-hmm. that's the standard. Like, him, but him at college, Belichick, uh, former yeah. coach um, uh, for the Florida State Seminoles, Bobby Bowden. Yeah. Um, just like legacy. Just that, that level legacy. of excellence. Yeah. Coach K in college basketball. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He's been there for, I think, at Duke for like 42 mm-hmm. years long time long yeah time. Co- coach greg popovich of the san antonio spurs he just mm-hmm. became the most winning as head coach in nba history last night oh wow wow okay. and i mean you know like think think about that spurs dynasty that spurs mm-hmm. dynasty from 98 to i would yeah. say when duncan retired in 2017 2018 mm-hmm. that 20 year stretch right there i mean from a basketball perspective they were the patriots of the nba yeah yeah. I mean, but that, but people don't understand, like as a coach to, to have that discipline, because mm-hmm. what's we, what we know about a lot of athletes in team sports, when you win, mm-hmm. you kind of just like, all right, I mean, I won. So why it, people don't understand that mindset of like, once you win mm-hmm. to be able to go back and do it all over again, knowing mm-hmm. that you cannot do it the same exact way. Sports right. is the only thing where you cannot use the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Yeah. You got to make the adjustments or else because people will peep your game. It, and I mean, you have to. like, I, I, I mean, you know, I know we got two minutes left, but I, I, if people really want to know, like, if, if we can summarize this whole lesson today, go go study Nick Saban. I mean, yeah. seriously, go go yeah. study his methodologies, his practice, his, I mean, his yeah. discipline, his regimen, his routine. His, mm-hmm. I mean, Everything of when we talk about peak coach performance, and I mean mm-hmm. day in and day out, not only doing the, the big macro things, but the, the little things, that mm-hmm. consistency in his routine, like his morning mm-hmm. routine, you know, having that same standard of expectations and not, you know, cutting corners and, you know, relying on old things like every day waking up, choosing, yeah. choosing on that individual day to have a level of excellence that will carry over into the next day when he has to re-choose all over again to yeah. do that same thing. Yeah. People don't understand how much discipline and how much just moxie. Word of the day is moxie. And if you don't know what that moxie. word means, go look it up. Because yeah. when we talk about coaches having that peak performance, you have to have a certain level of moxie about you as well. Right. I think that what you said um, and what we've discussed today, and I'm, I'm going to add just a couple of things in closing, is that we've shared a holistic approach to high performance coaching. You know, we didn't talk about nutrition and energy systems, but we did talk about physical training, athlete fitness, athlete health and safety, psychology and mental skills, and athletes maturation. We talked about those things, but in essence, what we've given you all is the formula, the holistic formula for high performance coaching through a mental health lens, from a human development lens is what we've offered. Um, And that's it. You know, it's you're, you're, you're coaching human beings, not, not machines. 
it's 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 all about the win, but it's not all about the win. Um, because if if the human being is not winning in each domain, so we when you think about your life, think about your life in domains, your health and well-being, there's a reason why that's the number one domain, right? Your health and well-being, your relationships is the number two domain, your career is the third domain. Your fourth domain is how you allocate your time. Your fifth domain domain is your financial situation. Because we go through life holistically, Ronnie, if the, the domains of our life are not in their appropriate order, it, life is out of order and you are not yeah. going to be able to coach at a high performance level and you're not going to have consistency in the high performance of your athletes as we know because we see it all the time well folks that's all we have today ronnie it's 47 degrees now it, just, <laughs> it, just finished it, it jumped up a whole six degrees look folks we want you to have a great weekend enjoy some basketball and you know, if there's warm weather somewhere in the country it's got to be somewhere in the country there's some warm weather enjoy some sun and fun stay safe take care we will see you back this time next week. Same bat time and bat channel. See ya. Have a good weekend.